Hello, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio, Sinoland on the beaches of Normandy. And I am truly honored to go a few hours across the channel where John is. They call it the English Channel, but we don't call it that in France. <laughs> we call it La Manche. Anyway, go north into England up to Sheffield, and I am truly honored again to have Dr. John M. Hobson on the show today. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you back, and we've had we've had our technical difficulties getting this done. <laughs> but anyway, let me tell you know I had him on the show, God, maybe last year. I can't remember exactly when. About a I think book, it was like last year. His pre his previous book, and and then. I, I got his new book and read it and was blown away. And I said, I got to get this guy back on. So let me um, read his um, uh, wonderful uh, short CV. John Hobson, FBA, is professor of politics and international relations at the University of Sheffield, having taught previously at the University of Sydney, 1997 to 2004, and La Trobe University in Melbourne, 1992 to 1997. He has written nine books to date, with his most recent one just coming out this September, entitled Multicultural Origins of the Global Economy Beyond the Western-Centric Frontier, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Cambridge University Press, he re his research since 2000, uh, the year 2000, has focused on the critique of Eurocentric world global history, which is the subject of Eastern origins and multicultural origins. Uh, the East, uh, multi uh, Eastern Origins is, is the previous book that I had read and, and we talked about, as well as the critique of Eurocentric international theory in his book, The Eurocentric Conception of World Politics, Cambridge University Press, 2012. And uh, fans out there, uh, I, I just finished reading John's thought-provoking and enlightening book, Multicultural Origins of the Global Economy Beyond the Western-Centric Frontier. And this... Um, is a follow-up to his previous book. And uh, unfortunately, I'm traveling. And so I, I actually have both books and I was going to be very proud to hold them up and show you all. But I do have them, but I'm traveling, so I couldn't put them in my suitcase. Uh, and this is a follow-up to his Eastern Origins of Western Civilization. And we're upon, we had a wonderful interview uh, talking about your previous book. And incredibly, in spite of its academic bent, <laughs> Our discussion and the transcript have amassed 36,000 visitors to my website. I mean, it's just like, go figure, John. See, China Rising Radio Sinoland Radio Sinoland fans must be enlightened. So, um, uh, it was so good to have you on the show. Oh, pleasure, Jeff. And I do look forward to checking out John's 2012, The Eurocentric Conception of World Politics and... Um, Anyway, I do really recommend that you uh, pick up his uh, new book, Multicultural Origins of the Global Economy. Uh, I finished it uh, much, much wiser. And you don't even have to buy it. You know, just ask your local library, school, university, or place of worship to get it for everybody's benefit. And they may, already, may even already have it. And, and, and librarians love it when somebody comes in and asks, to buy, asks that a book be bought. You know, it makes them really feel like they're you know, helping, helping, um, helping, uh, their communities. So, um, uh, do go to your library and ask for it. I'm not going to read it out here, but I have John's email, uh, website, blog, YouTube, uh, et cetera. So, sir, are you ready to get ready? Are you ready to get going? I mean, <laughs> I'm ready to rumble, Jeff. <laughs> All right. Question number one, after I wrote my first book, 44 days backpacking in China, I realized I had made historical errors about the Mao era, which I corrected in my next work, China Rising, but it all only involved a few pages of book number one. We had a great discussion about your previous book, Eastern Origins of Western Civilization, and your new book, Multicultural Origins of the Global Economy, is not just a few changes, but I mean, it's a really serious attempt to step beyond your earlier work and take a, a look at history with with a wide angle lens, and it, I, I was I I, I I thought it took a lot of courage for you to do that. Tell us about your journey of discovery and why you thought it was so important to uh, set the record straight, so to speak. Yeah, no, it's a as usual, Jeff. It's a really perceptive 
question. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess after East Norton's came out, you know, um, I saw all manner of critiques. Um, I had the Marxists saying that there just wasn't enough on on kind of social process, uh, on class, on the mode of production, um, <laughs> which 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 I. I, I took that to heart and I and I think uh -huh. it's a really good point. And I'll tell you why I think it's a really good point. Because what you get in East Origins, and in fact, what you get in the California school that Jack Goldstone talks about, you know, Andre Gunder Frank and Kenneth Parents, it's very much a kind of inverse diffusion model. So you now we're all critical of Eurocentric Western diffusion models where modernity emerges in Europe, you know, magically. And then it diffuses out. Well, all we were doing was inverting that. And that's not really an answer. And it leads you into all sorts of problems of Occidentalism and so on and so forth. The great thing about stuff, work that was brought in the mode of production, um, I'm thinking of a book, Alex Anievas and uh, Karem Nisantiolu. Uh, they do a lot of non Eurocentric work, but they also got stuff on class and mode of production. And what I like about it is that. If you just focus on external factors in explaining, say, the rise of global capitalism, you end up with a model that can't explain anything because it has to be something going on, say, in Europe that contributes to this. Otherwise, it's just another, it's an Asian miracle story. And it, yeah. I, it satisfied me. So, so it forced me into a valley, into, a, into another another space where I had to confront the hardest question, which is how, you know, because I'm a social scientist, um, how do you retain a non-Eurocentric account, in this case, of the rise of the global economy? And looking at what the Europeans did, did right, or however you want to phrase that, did wrong, whatever, but what their input was. Now, Non-Eurocentrics avoid that like the plague. They don't want to go there because then you're starting to, what they think you're doing is you're going into that whole kind of Eurocentric chamber. Yeah. yeah. European exceptionalism. And they want to kick that out. But I'm saying that if you kick it out, you lose an explanation. It's not, it's not really going to work. So then you have to navigate that. And chapters 11 and 12, where I'm looking at the rise of modern capitalism, particularly in Britain, gee, that was... That was mm -hmm. hard things I've done. And and I just, you know, I, I remember little quips um, about the book, you know, some of those biting uh, re reviews on, on Amazon.com, you know, where, where you get somebody saying, oh, Hobson, you know, the, here we go with a diatribe about the West is bad and the East is good. And that, that kind of struck home, actually, I have to say. And and so, you know, as you will know from, from the book, yeah. I, I, I try and break down that binary, and I find that that binary is there in a lot of post-colonial work. Um, and so, in a way, using my own book as, a, as the target of critique felt safer for me than targeting a whole load of other names that I don't really want to <laughs> besmirch. So yeah. that there is a lot going on there. But on the, and, and the final point I'll say is that, you know, I've wanted to write, I have genuinely wanted to write this book all my life. This is the book I wanted to do um, because I've always, for some reason, been obsessed with the, the, the whole rise of capitalism debate. In 1982, I was introduced to it as a student and I've always wanted to get that right. And I've had many stabs at it actually, um, but this is the, the final stab at it. And yeah, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's a, yeah. a really interesting book, and um, and uh, and I and I have to you know say you know well when I read uh, Eastern Origins of Western Civilization, I thought yeah this is this th this this aligns with my this aligns with my um, uh, worldview you know West bad East good <laughs> yeah and yeah. then you you had the courage to you know question that and that it's not so black and white and that yeah. there were there was a lot of there was a lot of um, you know um, cross pollination and good and bad, and so it forced me to question my worldview too. So uh, and that brings us up to another point. Uh, we usually think of the fifteenth to the nineteenth century slave industry being West Africa 
and the to, to the Americas, but 11 to 14 million slaves were stolen from East Africa and shipped to West Asia. Tell us about that. That was shocking. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just axiomatic, you know, with Black Lives Matter and everything, whenever anybody ever says anything about the slave trade, well, we think of the Atlantic slave trade and the horrors of the Middle Passage and so on and so forth. But nobody really, certainly not in the public sphere, ever thinks of the West Asian slave trade. And I call it the West Asian slave trade rather than the Islamic slave trade, um, because I don't think it's it's a function of, of Islam so much. Um, but exactly when it started, I'm not sure because I'm writing a book on the origins of Islam and it seems that it started even even before Islam began. Yeah. So you know, this has got a lo- this has got a long pedigree. Um, and even that question itself is interesting because I don't think it, it I gave the impression it started with Islam in the book, you know, and I don't I don't think that's right. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is this, in terms of what we discussed, Jeff. West bad, East good. What you know, there's a again, there's a real balancing act. I'm having to navigate lots of balancing acts in this book. You know, the balancing act between the internal and the external when explaining the rise of capitalism, for example. Here's another one, right? So, you know, the hardline post colonialists, and I have a few of them as my friends uh, who I greatly value and admire, will just say to me, John, what are you doing? What, what are you bringing in all this? West Asian slave trade. I mean, all you're doing, you, you, you're making it look like, well, everyone was doing it. So what's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah. Moral, moral equivalence. Moral equivalence. <laughs> you know, you're just letting the West off the hook. Now, clearly, I don't want to do that. That's not my aim. And here's the interesting bit. Um, there's a guy called Ricardo de Chesney. There's a whole story behind that. I won't go into it. But you know, the guy lost his job recently, actually. Um, well, I, well, I won't go into it because it's 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 sensitive. But um, he's he you know he wrote a, a short piece basically basically saying that you know well the West Asians are the Muslims are doing it you know what so there's you know he, he was using it as a way of deflecting the critique from the West. That's not my aim. This is not. This, no. I don't want to be doing world history that is all about defending the West. Nor do I want one that's just hammering the West all the time and 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 making the non-West look like you know pure and virginal or so. I, I I don't I just I want I'm an academic, not an activist, and so I'm trying to sort of give as clear a view of my of the world as I can. And I and and I think it's my beef is. I don't bring in the West Asian slave trade to, to, to use the moral equivalence argument. I use it in, in order to point out that, hey, you know, things, you, you, there were about maybe 12 million um, shipped on the Middle Passage to the New World and the Atlantic. The West Asian slave trade, as I say, I mean, it probably began well before 700 and it ended in the 20th century. And there were probably somewhere around 11 to 14 million slaves that were taken out during mm-hmm. that period. Obviously, a, a, a roughly equivalent figure, albeit over, you know, 12 centuries or more, whereas the Atlantic one was, you know, 16th, 17th, 18th century. So, but um, it, it was a very different slave trade. And I and I think that once you start recognizing all this stuff and opening up the world to this bigger picture, you can start almost doing a kind of comparative analysis. You know, and it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, most, for every... For every um, one male shipped in the West Asian slave trade, there were two females. It was the other way around in the Atlantic. For every one female, there were two males. And there's a reason for that. So that in the in the West Asian slave trade, a lot of them went into harems. Mm-hmm. A lot of them went into um, households. Mm-hmm. Uh, and And then the men ended up in kind of the army. Um, and whereas in the Atlantic slave trade, they were shipped over as just human labor fodder. Yeah, 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 backbreaking labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we know the story of that. So yeah. you know, if if you want to do some kind of moral equivalence, I don't know if you can, but you know, yeah. what you can do <laughs> what we do know is that you had a life expectancy of seven years in the Atlantic slave trade, and that was okay because you could just you could just replenish your stock by bringing yeah. over more Africans. Yeah. Who, who who cares? But with the West Asian slave trade, you know, young girls, 
five, six, seven in harems and, yeah. and young boys, you know, who went pearl diving and died of shock and, and not drowning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I can't, I can't, I'm not, I, can't, I don't see how you can make moral equivalent stories in any way. I, I just, it's just too hard to do. But, but, um, but certainly there were, it, it was a more humane, I, I will, maybe I'm contradicting myself. There were more humane elements to the West Asian slave trade. Um, you could win your freedom. Some of them became powerful. Some of them became, um, uh, you know, rulers of dynasties like the Fatimids. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and you could win your freedom. Um, yeah, it wasn't going to happen in the Atlantic. So, yeah, I think that's a big story that that has sort of been covered up by well-meaning leftists. Um, yeah. And but I don't want to be a bad-meaning rightist. By <laughs> well, you know, the, the the slave trade must have been before, because Islam is, you know, what, Muhammad 746 or whatever it is. 32, he, he dies. Yeah, um, and because and, you know, the, the Vikings, the Vikings were plundering what is today Ukraine and Belarus for slaves. You know, and selling them all over, all over Europe, and I suspect, you know, that the, they were the, some of those slaves uh, went down into the uh, Levant. I mean, I, I mean, I would have to think they would. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, and then of course, Char Charlemagne. Uh, you know, he was plundering Russia, uh, uh, um, Ukraine, and Belarus for slaves and bringing them, <laughs> selling them, <laughs> selling them in Western Europe, and. Yeah. Yeah. Fact, that's where the that's where the name uh, Russia comes from is Rus uh, the, the Viking for red because they had a lot of them had red hair and and uh, anyway can't wait to read your book about Islam. <laughs> you, use, you use some terms that that um, um, I I found engaging and I'd like for to ask you to um, you kind of par kind of parse them with uh, for 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 the. Um, uh, for the fans out there, and that is, um, you used Eurocentrism, Eurofetishism, which is really a good one, and then imperial porn. Uh, what 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 is the difference between those three? Yeah, I mean that, <clears throat> that that's uh, it's a very pertinent question because the book is framed around a critique of these concepts. So obviously, it's important to understand them. So Eurocentrism, yeah, that <clears throat> the notion that um, the West is pretty well all good, is the unique source of progressive institutions, technologies, and modern capitalism. Um, and so you, a Eurocentric account of the world basically just focuses on, on the ingenuity and goodness of the West. Eurofetishism is a term I use to capture a certain brand of post-colonial thought. Um, and it's, it's, it's not even true to say that it's post-colonial Marxism because that's, that's still not right. Um, it's a certain brand that are located in the work of Wallace Dean in particular, his 1997 article. This is the view that, um, yeah, the West did make the modern world. Um, it was the sole actor. There is no non-Western agency, just like the Eurocentric say, but it's done in order to critique the West. So th its main beef, its main beef is to show that imperialism has been central to the creation of the modern world and that has been linked to capitalism and that it has been basically evil and it's the pure soul product of the West. But the, the problem with that is that you, you then get into all your binaries. Well, I can come back to that. Imperial porn is really what I would say Euro fetishists engage in. So, you know, the obvious example is Africa. Um, so, to, I mean, in today, you know, we have we have constantly streaming onto our news service, you know, the latest desperate scene in one of the African countries of whether there's some kind of Holocaust going on or starvation or whatever. And in, imperial porn is, you know, like like poverty porn. You know, we sort of watch all these hopeless, helpless people um, and and then it sort of elicits the white man's burden. It elicits a desire in us to go and rescue and save them from themselves, of course. We mm -hmm. And all of that. We had nothing to do with their plight at all. Um, and and the, the irony is that Eurofetishism buys into that. And yet that's exactly what it shouldn't be doing. It should be critiquing the whole notion. 
Um, so that's how those three really fit together. Um, I mean, I should say also that imperial porn is fundamental to Eurocentrism too. Right? It's yeah. Not, you know, it is this view that they're hopeless and, and we, you know, we've got to do something about it. Well, one thing for sure, the the West is very evangelical, <laughs> both in terms of culture and uh, religion and economic model, and um, so, um, and that brings us to another thing. Is and this is something that we discussed in our first interview, uh, and I never really got a handle on it, and and so may, hopefully you can help me. Europe began its colonization of much of the rest of the world starting in the 15th century and it, it really took off in the 16th century uh, yet you say the west did not have real imperial dominance until the mid 19th century and that just blows me away so how how do you parse colonialism and imperialism because for me they they're they're kind of the same thing but you 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 have you have a more nuanced uh, uh, interpretation. So please tell us about that. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, again, here we go with another one of these balancing acts. Um, another fairly difficult balancing act that I'm having to perform. So um, there's no question, of course, that you know the <clears throat> Europeans um, colonized the Americas, <clears throat> and the story unfolds, you know, after 1492. Um, <clears throat> A lot of decolonialists, decolonialists like Walter Mignolo, the end of that for them. This is it. This is the beginnings of the modern world born in the crucible of uh, imperialism and imperial genocide. <clears throat> but and then and then <clears throat> if you go to your standard kind of Eurocentric um, schooling, you know, your old history lessons back in school where you learn about Vasco da Gama and you know, going off to India and and setting up the Vasco da Gama epoch, and <clears throat> he landed in Africa, East Africa, um, set up Fort Jesus in Mombasa, and <clears throat> the story kind of is of Europe colonizing the world informally in Afro Asia until later, and formally in the Americas. But the the argument, it one of the things that I'm doing in this book is to cut the West down to size. Um, I do my critique of Western centrism, therefore, is aimed at Eurocentrics, but also Eurofetishists, who all I think over exaggerate the centrality and power of the West. Um, and so, if you actually, when I so when when I looked at what was going on in Africa and India and East Asia and the Ottoman and Safavid empires, you know, which are the main areas there, um, the Europeans had very little power actually. Um, you know, they groveled to the Japanese emperors. Um, they groveled to the Chinese emperors. They <laughs> ne never managed to get anywhere vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and the Dutch eventually gave up and just, kind of, yeah. you know. I remember, I remember reading that. That was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, for for uh, for Western this mighty Western civilization that was all powerful, you really do have to explain how the Dutch ended up on a tiny little island um, in Japan and were beaten like dogs regularly, um, <laughs> but but took it because you know the trade. There was, was money. There was money. <laughs> <laughs> money to be made. <laughs> Yeah. And so, so you know, East Asia was pretty much no-go zone. They were invited into um, Safavid and Ottoman empires for various political reasons um, on the part of the emperors. Um, they didn't live a particularly salubrious life there, but they were grateful to be there. You know, they were they were basically had to you know basically slaves vis-a-vis -vis the Mughal emperor for a long time until the Mughal empire started to decline. Yeah. You know, and then in East Africa, where you've got the Portuguese, as I said, in, in Mombasa, but the Indians who were there um, trading and the Swahili yeah. merchants, they just carried on as normal, you know, and yeah. eventually they were, the Portuguese were booted out. You never hear much about that, but they were booted out, you know. they. So it's all just, you know, I'm sorry, but it's been exaggerated. And in the process, it's kind of flattered the Western ego that we could go and do these controlling things you know i mean 
terrible things that supposedly was going on. Um, they would have done a lot worse if they could have, but they didn't have the power to do so. And it, it yeah. was really, you know, the Brits were very lucky to get India. I mean, that was a huge fluke. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into all that now, but the bottom line is, well, you yeah, know, you think about it. It wasn't until 1885 that Europe was slicing up Africa into colonial territories. It, it, it wasn't till you know, the mid 19th century that they consolidated their power through luck in India, you know, and, and yes, it intensi empire intensified after that until eventually, of course, it was brought down. But no, I think it's just been exaggerated. I think Eurofascists exaggerate it for a political effect and Eurocentrics exaggerate it for ego effect. Yeah. Yeah. You, in both of your books, you know, you just the, the whole the whole, you know, um, you know, portrait of, of that part of the world and how savvy and um, you know, the, the Indians were and, and, and how um, uh, organized the Chinese were and how entrepreneurial the Africans were. And you, you just and, and yet you, you know, uh, the, the, it's almost like totally forgotten, you know, the, the Europeans come in a deus ex machina and uh, sa save the day like a Greek, like a Greek tragedy. Unbelievable. Yeah. The uh, tell us a little bit about and and these these questions are not in really super order. I just when I read when I read a good book like John's, I just start taking notes. And so this is sort of a chronological order in his book. So they may not uh, make sense uh, in this interview, but it's just the way he took chapters. And, and I would just pick out things that really interested me. And one of them that really struck me uh, was the, um, and you mentioned it more than once, I think you mentioned it two or three times, the the uh, Zungar Mongol genocide by the Chinese. I knew the Zungars were a pain in the butt for the <laughs> Chinese for centuries. And uh, so, uh, and uh, so please tell us a little bit, you know, just about Chinese, um, uh, foreign policy. Uh, obviously, they wiped out the Zungars. Uh, but beyond that, just something about China's uh, foreign policy. You know, pre nineteen eleven, when it, uh, when when the empire, when the uh, when the um, uh, the emperors uh, fell. Yeah, I, I think um, I think I talked a bit about the Chinese standard of civilization, uh, etc. In our in our last interview. Um, so uh, I'll try and keep this as pity as I can, but China's foreign policy is is interesting. Um, uh, so bottom line is very quickly, so I'm recapping some of this, but you know you had the Chinese tribute system, um, and you had the inner zone and the outer zone. Um, so the inner zone, uh, Vietnam, Japan, Ryukyu, and Korea, and they were the, the most kind of loyal and the closest, and then Southeast Asia on the outer zone. Um, and and I genuinely do believe that relations between all those politics were were very peaceful. I mean, it's, it's just incredible, really. Um, particularly particularly when you compare it to what was going on in Europe at the time. Um, so they had their standard civilization. China is most civilized. Um, the tribute states were kind of barbaric, and then you had the nomadic societies, which were perceived as savage. Now, of course, in standard Western thinking, if you're in Western thinking, if you're defined as a savage in the 19th century, Houston, you've got a problem. You, you got, <laughs> you're going to get invaded and colonized. I mean, it's coming. It's coming. Whereas in the Chinese system, that I don't do not believe that was the case. And as you said, the, the Mongols had been a complete com, complete pain up the butt for the Chinese for a long yeah, time. Centuries, um, and centuries, centuries and centuries and centuries. Of, you know, I mean, they weren't. They weren't major invasions. Um, by and large, they were kind of raiding parties, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this kind of thing. But they were linked to Tibet, and there's a whole story around that. Um, and you know, so so China and China goes back many, many thousands of years. Um, but you know, 1683, you know, the whole thing kicks off, and China starts to expand, starts taking over Taiwan and other countries, and then expands north and northwestwards um and that's pretty much complete by 1760 and it's it's tapped off it's capstoned by the zunga mongol genocide 
Um, so, you know, they, I mean, I, you know, about 20% of the Zungas were, were killed, um, you know, physically killed in battle. I think but something like 20% died of illnesses and a whole bunch just fled. And I think yeah. kind of Russia and, um, you know, so, uh, and, and that was the final straw. And, you know, one of the things I should say, Jeff, is that when I'm talking about the dark side of non-Western agency and the Zungu Mongol genocide is one of those moments, um, like the West Asian slave trade is another moment. You know, I take no joy in saying any of this. Um, I don't enjoy doing this, but I do it because I, I just don't think we can go on any longer with this kind of binary view of the world. Yeah. It's all bad and the East is all innocent. And I don't want... Not only innocent, but helpless. Yeah. Helpless. <laughs> but that, that's right. That's the real point. <laughs> innocent and helpless. <laughs> there were some helpless, passive, pathetic people. You know, they did all sorts of things oh, and they could yeah, use and abuse power. Yeah, you know, that was really power, true. They had power. My God, they had power. You know, but you, you'd never know that. Yeah. Reading the Eurocentric stuff and the Eurofetish stuff, you know, they're just a bunch of innocents, you know, just lying around <laughs> waiting, waiting for the West to come along. You know? <laughs> no, history was going on out there. Yeah, yeah. Was going on out there, my friend. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, that would just be one instance. And you know, Japanese imperialism, which was racist patriarchal 1894 to 1945 yeah, I mean, yeah the Me meiji restoration I'm, I'm, I'm you know i'm moving beyond the beyond beyond the remit here but um yeah i mean that's that was the final kind of um piece of that imperial expansion um which kind of to my knowledge ended around 1760 okay mm. You keep talking about agency, uh, and I yeah. would kind of fall in. I, I would think yeah. I understood it while I was reading your yeah. your book, and then I thought, well, maybe I don't understand it. So please tell us about agency. Uh, and we're not talking about real estate or insurance. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about agency. No, it's a very important question. That absolutely, and and I think that that I think really that is where confusion can occur. Because when we think of agency, we always associate it with, with power in some sense. Not necessarily power over somebody else, but the ability to do something free of constraint or relatively free of constraint. I've got agency in my life means I can, I can pretty much do what I want, albeit within limits. I can't go out and stab my neighbor who's been driving me crazy. <laughs> well, even, though, even though you'd like to. <laughs> well, actually, I've got great neighbors here, so <laughs> don't watch them. Just joking. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, so, it, you know, you could have a situation where you have agency, even when you're on the losing side of a power re relationship, which is really, really counterintuitive. Because if you go back to the kind of post-colonial Euro fetches that I'm talking about, they'll say, well, hang on a minute. You know, the West has been, dom they'll say the West has been dominant in the last 500 years. Here's John coming along telling us about the agency of the Swahili merchants and the Indian Gujaratis and all the rest of it. So what, what on earth does that mean, though? That they're, they're still in a situation, a structural situation of Western dominance. And, you know, these are fairly meaningless terms. But I'm using agency in, in quite a broad remit, you know, in the sense that I'm interested in not simply whether who wins a particular um, power battle, um, but who, I, I'm more interested in it as a, as a means of considering how the world has been shaped. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you know, sweet African slavers had an agency in this sense. They had an agency in the sense that they were able to sort of um, sell slaves to West Asians and obviously to the Europeans. And the it, actually the Atlantic was far more important in terms of the first global economy than, than the West Asian one was, simply because the slaves were taken over to the New World. They produced all sorts of crucial products which were then shipped back to Europe, which then had an impact there. The individual life of a slave in, in, on the slave ships and when they arrived was pretty small. Yeah. Um, in terms of their life chances, 
pretty well null and void. Um, they didn't have any meaningful agency in their lives. But I use it in a more generic sense. Without, without the um, work that those slaves have been put to, Europe would be in a very different place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, and my point is, we can't tell the story of the British Industrial Revolution um, or the rise of capitalism in Europe by ignoring what was going on out there, because this was crucial for the life chances of British industrialization and Europe. Mm -hmm. So I'm using it in a much more generic sense. And why? Why do I do this? Because if you if you listen to Eurocentrics, they'll tell you that the West monopolizes agency, by which they mean the West is the one that creates capitalism and the West is the one that expands it across the world and the West is the one that produces all the good things in the world, human rights. <laughs> and the non-West has does none of this, therefore it has no such agency. And that's what I'm beefing about. Yeah, that's what we were taught in school, right? When we grew yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> the West is the best. <laughs> the West is the best. No, you know, I'm going to get critics saying, oh, God, John, all you want to do is hang it on the West. No, no, I don't. I just want people to be honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's all. Yeah. The uh, you, you use um, more than once also, uh, of course, I'm very much into Taoism and Confucianism yeah. and yeah. And I do B Buddhist meditation once a week with a group of nice people uh, in uh, on the west coast of uh, the United States every Excellent. Sunday. And so I'm I'm very into Buddhism, Taoism, and yeah. uh, Confucianism. And you use Taoist dialectics a lot, yin and yang. Uh, you know, tell us how that fits into your worldview. Yeah. Um. So when I when I started this this long march. <laughs> yeah, good one. Back, it, back in 2000 um you know i was sort of leaning towards this and then i read um a book by lily ling who became a good friend of mine and we um became co-editors of a book series that um we set up and unfortunately she 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 passed away a couple of years ago and she can't have been more than 56 is terrible. Oh, terrible. Anyway, Lily Ling, L H M Ling, L I N G. She's the one who's done all this work, right? The Tao of world politics, for example. Um, and she's been pushing this, she pushed this all her career. So for her, the yin and the yang was crucial because, and that's what's fundamental to, to the ontologically what I'm doing, because I'm interested in how the non West has shaped the West, how the non West is in the West even though the West wants to pretend otherwise. <laughs> and how the West is clearly in the non-West. Yeah. And, and the, and the non-Westerners will, will clearly admit that. Um, and, and so this is important because it, it's a kind of, it's a way of a healing, healing process. You know, we, what's the, in the end, what's the point of all this? The point of all this is for, as far as I'm concerned, is for the West to acknowledge the debt that it owes to the non-West. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to stop to stop treating it as an other, which needs to be either saved through imperialism or economically exploited through imperialism. And you tell mm -hmm. me, I'll, um, I'll, but whatever. Um, this this isn't going to heal the world. All we're going to do is carry on with these binaries that have done so much damage. Mm -hmm. So yes, recognizing the non-West in the West. I mean, Eurocentrism is all about forcing the non-West out of the West in a mental sense, so that you'd have this pure West. But when they did that, they left us with a dysfunctional West, with, an, with a mm -hmm. pure, hyper-rational, mechanical notion. And the non-West, well, that was the realm of spirituality and superstition, voodoo, backwardness. <laughs> there was humanity in that. And the West evacuated its humanity from its mm -hmm. self-identification. So if you can bring the two together, um, then you've got a chance of not just creating a fuller, better West, but mm -hmm. a better world. You know, and I know yeah. that's very airy-fairy, but that is, that's the point of it, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have, you use a lot of terms, John, and, and uh, I've expanded my... Uh, so, so, social sciences vocabulary significantly re, reading your books and getting to know you 
Uh, first and second global economies. Again, it was all a little bit fuzzy for me. Um, uh, and then, and for me, it's just global capitalism. So how do you parse global capitalism and the first and second global economies, please? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a very interesting question as usual, Jeff. Um, so um, the I have this thing called the Eurocentric Big Bang Theory, right? It's a notion, it's the Eurocentric notion that modern capitalism exploded into existence spontaneously as a result of its own rational institutions <laughs> and ingenuity in Britain. Oh. And then expanded outwards. And as it expanded outwards, that was your globalization. And then it created a modern global capitalist economy. And that would be dated to kind of 1750 to, uh, and then up to 1850. And then after 1850, you got this new shiny global modern capitalist economy. But what, what the book is doing is kind of um, critiquing that notion. And one of the ways I critique it is to say, no, there was a global economy of sorts in place before British industrialization, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, British industrialization emerged out of that global economy, that without that global economy in place, British industrialization might well not have occurred. So that that kind of cuts from under the feet under the feet of Eurocentrism and and sort of starts to question the notion that you know Britain was kind of autonomous, that you could tell if you if you live in Britain, you you'll see documentaries every now and again, you know, with with nice cheery music talking about you know, <laughs> <laughs> how the Brits came up with British industrialization all by themselves and all the wonderful things they did. And you'll go and see a mill and you'll go to a you know a, a mine and a factory, etc. And, and, you know, the, I, I don't want to be a kind of nationalist self-flagellation sort of uh, person where I'm just kind of trying to pull down the Brits, you know, for, <laughs> you know which is what some would, would show. But our job is not to defend um, what goes on necessarily, but to think critically about it. And look, I mean, you know, if it wasn't for this bigger global economy within which Britain resided, it wouldn't have happened. Why? Because essentially... Um, and this is really the guts of the argument. Essentially, you know, for centuries, the Indians dominated the Indian cotton textile, the, the textile markets around the world. Indian yeah, markets. that was an amazing oh, story. I mean, it, it's and the Africans. And yeah. the Africans. Yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah. They, and, and the Westerners couldn't even use their gold and silver. They had to do all of their trading using, <laughs> using Indian prints. You, that was an, right. I, I love right. that whole that whole deal was just incredible. Yeah, I mean it's it's a you know when I when I came across all this stuff, it was <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> hey, you you have to ask yourself, well, well, how's this been left out? You know what? Yeah, what's no. been, well, the why it's been left out is because nobody wants to acknowledge that really because we <laughs> tell a wonderful story about ourselves. Yeah. You know, and we're not here to do that. That's not the point of being an academic. We're not voice, we're not spokespeople for the government or for society. That doesn't mean to say that we destroy everything about Britain. And I'm not interested in that either, but just a little bit of honesty. So, so yeah. what I do is to talk about historical global glo global historical capitalism and global modern capitalism. You okay. keep going, you keep going. I'm going to sh shut the sh uh, the 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 shutter because the the this what's it called? The the curtain. Oh, right. just, I've got I'm getting the sun in my face. Keep going for the fans. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So the, the the general the general belief is that before capitalism, you had kind of agrarianism and feudalism, um, and you know there might have been a bit of trade, but it was. What, what I'm saying is that roughly, you know, between 1500 and. 1850, and this global historical capitalism. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, if you if you go to say somewhere like China or India, <clears throat> you'll find that they're producing global trading commodities, porcelain, silk, um, tea, uh, and other things in China. And you know, this is remember, this is before 1850 when they're supposedly either Oriental despotisms on the old Marxist model or whether they're just basically agrarian structures. But what we've got here is a mixture of 
relation to production. We have free wage labor in this period. This is not unique to modern capitalism. We have free wage labor. We have wage labor. We had forced labor. We had household labor. All this stuff was going on simultaneously to produce commodities, many of which for the domestic market and some of which for the, were for the global market. And they had rational institutions mm -hmm. enable all this. For me, that's basically a form of capitalism, but it's not modern capitalism. And in the end, it's not modern capitalism, not because free wage labor was not the own, was, was not the key mode of relations, but because of technologies, because they did not use fully mechanized technologies. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you look at some of those silk frames that the Chinese came up with. My goodness me, these were, these were incredibly impressive things. Yeah. The, the, the mechanized technologies were not alien to the Chinese. Um, they, they had the um, big spinning frame for Amy, um, which, was, which was linked to uh, a river, just as in Britain, except this happened in the year 1200. <laughs> 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 and, and they could have, you know, they, I mean, according to um, the Nong Shu, um, this produced something like, I'm trying to remember how much it was, but it was like, um, I think something like 100, 100 pounds of, of cotton in, in 24 hours. I can't remember, the, I should have checked this, but the bottom line is, bottom line is, <clears throat> That even in 1825, when Richard Roberts' self-acting mule had come out, it was producing one seventh the amount of spun cotton in a 24-hour yeah. period. Now, I think the not shoot. I, I just can't believe that figure. That, that cannot be right. Okay, so let's say it's a sixth of that figure. It's still as much as a self-acting mule in 1825. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, this is phenomenal. I mean, they had 32 yeah. reels, you know. And now the difference between uh, that machine and a cotton spinning machine is the cotton spinning machine you'd have to draw draw the cotton out you don't have to draw um the hemp out it's you, you don't have to do that they could have added a draw bar no problem and if they had done that they might have had a uh, they might have had a chinese industrial revolution my hunch is that they wouldn't have because their cotton was very Oh, yeah, yeah, you say right. you talked yeah. about the differences in quality was really absolutely uh, right. Yeah, so, yeah, so low well, quality. So I think that the modern modern capitalism and you know Marxists have forgotten all about this. They're so obsessed with free wage labor as their defining criterion of what constitutes modern capitalism. They forget about technologies, and <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and so you need you need um, fully mechanized technologies, and I suspect that you need that mentality whereby technologies are used to displace variable capital workers over time. Clearly, you didn't have that in historical capitalism. But for that, the similarities were striking. And the, the one example I give of that is New World Caribbean exploitation, the plantations, the mills that they set up. That was as close to modern capitalism as you get absent the 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 uh, mechanized technology yes mm -hmm. it starts to come in after 1750 but that was an import from britain so yeah. there's a lot of similarities and so i think you can talk about <clears throat> global capitalism from 1500 to the modern period but i'd say it's global historical capitalism up to about 1850 and then gradually modern global capitalism yeah. supersedes it after 1850. well you know you you know you uh, yeah you did a really good job of uh you know parsing this out in your book uh, that was the hard, that, uh, that's so hard. The, the well just the that you know the indians were more capitalist than the <laughs> than the than the than, than england and and uh, and the portuguese <laughs> you know and, well, sorry, uh, and that's the other thing i should have mentioned they were just incredibly you know, just real mercantile merchants you know i mean they were incredible yeah. the indians yeah. Just well, yeah yeah and you look at the indians and the chinese today now these 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 people don't mess about when it comes yeah. to um, capitalism. Yeah, that didn't just appear recently. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, you know, some of some of your depictions, and 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 I didn't ask about India because because I'm more focused on China, but some of your depictions of China's economic activity. I mean, they defy imagination. Wow. Like in the 17th century, now mind you, the 17th century, that's the 1600s, 
the the Jung family had 2,300 ships, 250,000 well-armed soldiers, and Chinese private trade was 10 to 20 per, 10 to 20 times more than the official Chinese tribute system and possibly up to 30 times. It's just it's staggering. So how you know t- taking that kind of magnitude how do you compare China's global economic footprint during the during this colonial period to today, where uh, China is obviously a, a, a massive uh, economic uh, force uh, in uh, global capitalism? Yeah, I mean, I, I see what's going on today as pretty much a return to to where they were. So, so I do I do talk about the return of China to near the cent to the to near the center of the global economy. Um, and then, and then you have to ask yourself the question: Given that, really, up to 1800, you know, the the, the figures are all mind-boggling. Yeah, it's just staggering. Um, yeah, and it, you know, e- even after that, I mean, I think the one that blows me away most is the cotton production. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we're we're told that British Industrial Revolution created, you know, the the biggest glut of surplus of, of cotton textiles and raw cotton the world had ever seen. And, you know, the, the, it was dominant after the 1820s. Even in 1900, it was still producing the same amount as China. <laughs> <laughs> no, unbelievable. Um, yeah. They got, they got a, a lead by about 1913, and then gradually that lead was pulled back and then by i think the 1950s china was in the lead again yeah you might have been in the lead about 1930s you know um the 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 real the real real question is how how was this what why what what explains the gap between say 1850 to 2000 because you know by 2000 thereafter you know china's china's back um Yeah, yeah roaring so that's a whole nother story, and and you yeah. know you, you you get your sense of humiliation and 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 so on and so forth. Yeah, um, which I've written yeah, a lot about. It, it, it's absolutely, it, it's mind boggling. I remember when I did Eastern Origins, the mind boggling figure for me was that China was producing 125,000 tons of of iron in uh, 11 70, in 1170 in 1078. <laughs> <laughs> and Britain was producing 76,000 tons in 1788. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's it's the same kind of thing when you when you look at what they were. I mean, the, the actually, you know what? The biggest one is what was going on in the lower Yangtze Delta, where um where cotton textiles were produced in factories, albeit not with mechanized technologies, that's true. Um and they were pumping out two billion yards, <laughs> two billion yards of cotton textiles in 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 the sort of mid nineteenth century. Well, that's that's more than the whole of India. <laughs> and India was the world's major yeah, exporter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's incredible. But yeah, we're just, we're just none of this registers. Certainly not yeah. in the Western mind. <laughs> in spite of that another amazing thing that you talked about an amazing factoid is that in 1606 chi- the chinese tribute system accepted inferior status to the japanese tribute system the japanese were ranked below the heathen dutch <laughs> tell us about that that's incredible yeah. This is a, a really, really interesting part of East Asian history. Um, and it's very curious. And I, I would like to have done more work on it, particularly okay. vis-a-vis the Chinese situation. But, you know, I think purists would say that there wasn't technically a Japanese um, tribute system, but it was something quite very similar. And again, there's so little out there on this. Yeah, yeah. It's really frustrating. So I'd love to know much more about it, actually. But anyway, bottom line is that yeah, there were there were four four groups. I mean, China had like 72 at its height, 72 battles. There were four in the Japanese tribute system, which which came in uh, I don't know, around 1603, I guess. And so the Koreans were the number one 
they were ranked the highest, which, you know, well, they were the number one Chinese vassal as well. <laughs> you still <know, laughs> yeah. a problem, you know. Yeah. Then you've got then you've got um, the Ryukyus, which of course became Okinawa. Then you've got the Dutch, and they were always ridiculed them and treated, as I said earlier, treated like dogs, <laughs> you know. And then you've got these people known as the Chinese um, at the bottom. Now we're told that the East Asian system was dominated by the mighty Chinese, um, that all the vassals, all the states in the system were vassals, and all the vassals were akin to satellites. Bow, bowing which, down. Yeah, which <laughs> revolved around in the natural cosmos of which China yeah. was the center, like, like in the heliocentric theory. Um, no. Uh, so one of the <laughs> things is that after 1600, 1603, if that was true, then how do we explain that A, China was in the Japanese tribute system and B, how its status was pretty lowly in there? How do we explain <laughs> it? And, and from what I can see, um, the, the, the Chinese accepted it, but the Japanese wanted it because there was a very beneficial trading relationship to be yeah. had. Because the Japanese... Yes, there's just all this confusion here. The 1639 ban on foreign trade, which Westerners take to mean that Japan no longer traded abroad. Yeah. Well, no, sorry, guys, but actually what happened was the Chinese did it on their behalf. <laughs> and, and the Dutch continued trading on their behalf, in effect. Um, but the Chinese, <clears throat> pardon me, were the major player. You know, and they took um, especially copper out, actually, because copper was very lucrative in the China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that Ch Japan yeah. was a huge, a huge producer of, of Absolutely. copper mines. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and you know, so they which which was which was the metal that the Chinese preferred for their coinage. Bingo. Yeah. Um, the silver was used for foreign trade. The copper was used yeah. for domestic trade. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we're told, oh, well, the Japanese um, stopped trading in 1639. No, the Japanese merchants did. But they had it done by others. Um, yeah. Then there's this thing about 1671 ban on silver trade. Well, again, you know, what happened was the, the Chinese were exporting copper. You know, yeah. I mean, who cares what the metal is, right? You know, so, so A, Japan remained open to trade. It was still trading. Um, but China was uh, a major player in there. Um, <clears throat> actually, I think the irony is that um, it was mo what was most sensitive about this is that Korea was the number one vassal in each. Well, if you yeah. owe allegiance to China and then you also have to owe allegiance to Japan, <laughs> it's, it's a mess. But, you know, the amazing thing about the East Asian system is that for all the bizarre stuff going on, and I, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but it was a bizarre system, but it was incredibly successful. Yeah, and and profitable and really? mutually beneficial. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as you said, uh, you're, you said there was the official yeah. bans, the official trade, but private trade was, you know, 10 to 20 times more, and it may be up to even 30 times more towards the, you know, uh, later on. So uh, it was almost like the tribute system was a bit of kabuki theater, you know, for, you know, for the, for, for, to, to avoid wars and avoid, you know, conflict and, uh, which is very Confucian. Yeah, but 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 let but, but let let's do some business together. <laughs> yeah. and, and it was a way of of you know, the whole tribute system really was just a facade. It was just an illusion. It was just a game, yeah. smoke yeah, and mirrors. Yeah, yeah. The only thing yeah. is, both sides were playing it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's you know the one thing, and this was true in both of your books that just struck me. You know that is is how the West likes to project. You know that the you know we're for you know low taxes on the people and limited government and <laughs> privileged free trade and, and and we're people focused and but that was China. China yeah. had low taxes on the people. Yeah. China had limited government Confucian yeah. limited government. They privileged free trade. Very people focused. 
And the reality is, is that the British wanted monopoly trade. They wanted to control the whole darn thing, not free trade. And they couldn't stomach China's, you know, managed liberal trade. And, and as you pointed out, you know, Britain had high taxes on the people, big government, government monopoly trade, and oligarchic uh, bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, 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 control. So tell you, to just <laughs> what what can you say about it? It's just like it's like everything's just turned upside down. Yeah, and um, so you know, we we have our old friend. The Eurocentric Oriental Despotism Thesis, born pretty much in the 19th century, continues on today, albeit in slightly different guise. Um, but the notion that, yeah, you know, Britain industrialized through low taxes, free trade, um, uh, a fiscally prudent state that didn't borrow too much. Um, it was China as an Oriental Despotism that taxes people completely into the dust. <laughs> the war with all its with all its neighbors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is literally the other way around. Um, and you know, when you you know, when I was doing those tables on um, taxes, the amount that the Chinese, I mean, <laughs> the tax on the peasants, you know, in the in the late eighteenth century, were were like two days' work a year. <laughs> <laughs> It's just absolutely mind-boggling. And yeah, then when you yeah. look at the the money spent on defense and you, you realize that at its ex extreme measurement, you know, in the second half of the 18th century, Britain was spending 17 times more in real terms. <laughs> yeah. it, it, you just can't get your head around it. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, if ever there was, if ever there was a myth that needs to be busted when it comes to Eurocentric world history. I would say this was one of the principal ones. Um, but, you know, Eurocentrism is very flexible. It, it, it's, it's like capitalism. It, it's, it's very creative. So if somebody like me comes along and says, look, hang on, guys, you've got this exactly the wrong way around. They'll say, oh, yeah. Okay. But... <laughs> <laughs> Because according to them, you need low taxes, low spending on <laughs> to get into capitalism. So then the, the question is, well, surely China should have got into capitalism, not Britain, right? According to your liberal logic. Uh, uh, and yeah. they'll reply by saying, oh, yeah, but you see, without warfare, there's nothing driving technology and yeah. and adapting and, and, and enhancing capitalism in order to be able to go to war. And that's why, you know, China... China, you know, uh, didn't go into go to war, but that, they've already contradicted the argument Oriental despotism because in Oriental despotism there's supposed to be no states that you go to war with. <laughs> then they go down the kind of tributary state. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Well, you know, it was a single state system, but they go off into the world and they'd start sort of, you know, uh, colonizing other countries and then draining them. There, I mean, it goes round and round. You, mm. you, you know, I, 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 they're hard to pin down because they don't want to be pinned down. Yeah, the argument slipped the whole time, but yeah, it is absolutely mind-boggling that in 1684, China moves to an average six percent tariff on foreign export. <laughs> right, yeah. Britain had been around an average of five percent, starts to move up, and by um, by 18 1825, it's got an average tariff around fifty-five percent. Uh, yeah, average tariff. That's on yeah. all imports. <laughs> and, and, it, and then we're told that it was Britain that industrialized through free trade and China didn't because it was protectionist. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, you know, you mentioned this about defense and uh, which is for me just a, a, a um, uh, Orwellian doublespeak for war. But uh, you, it's just incredible the contrast between the West nonstop wars and Asia's almost total lack of them. I mean, uh, ha why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I said before, you know, with the with the Chinese system, I mean, it was it it worked extremely well. Um, so <clears throat> you had the, the Chinese tribute system. Uh, a lot of states joined that, but they they weren't. They weren't subservient to China. I think if you, you know, a lot of Westerners view the tribute system as a kind of imperial system. 
um, and that, that, that states or polities in the region had no choice but to join um, for fear of being waged war upon. Um, I, I kind of liken that sort of argument to the whole thing about God, Jesus Christ, the Christian story. The Christian story would be that, you know, well, why does God never show himself? You know, you, you know. well, the reason why is because people have to choose to believe this stuff. They're not going to be bashed into it or forced into it or persuaded into it like that. They have to decide themselves. It's the same with the Chinese tribute system. The, the Chinese state wasn't threatening to go to war with the state if it didn't join. Mm -hmm. um, plenty didn't join. Plenty did join. Plenty did all sorts of things that irritated the Chinese. They let, <laughs> they let it go for most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned know. that. Yeah. yeah um, it, Very indulgent. A system doesn't last 2,000 years if it has to be backed up by the threat of brute force yeah that's yeah. what's gonna that's the lesson for russia and ukraine now that's the story that's going to unfold there in the next few years you can't force somebody to want to be part of a system just in the end it's not going to work yeah two thousand years this system lasted you know yeah. um so it was incredibly successful um state states pretty well were happy to play the game as i said um yeah then the question is the real question is why was europe so um besieged by, you know constant warfare in this whole period um the war the the reasons for war chopped and changed um territorial land grabs uh, in the 15th century uh religious wars in the 16th mm. i think you know um it, it's it's a whole mixture of things um but i i don't I don't think I've got an answer for you on this one, Jeff. And it, it's it's a great question. Um, and it's something I'd really like to think through more um, because it might help explain the eternal question of why the wars happen and, and what kind of state system is conducive. So so I'd, I'd like to think more about that. Um, All right. I'm sorry I can't answer it. Well, I'm jumping again. I'm jumping around a bit because as I went through the book, I just took notes and then asked him. But one of the incredible things that I just didn't really enjoyed, and I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, uh, Car you know Carl Lagersfield and Yves Saint Laurent with all the, the, the fashion industry and the modern fashion industry and everything. But you wrote uh, 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 quite uh, colorfully how changing African fashion tastes had a major impact on global trade for centuries. It was incredible. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to locate the origins of this, but um, there certainly was Indian cotton textile trade going to Africa as early as 1100. I, 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 I got a feeling it might have started earlier, perhaps around 900, you know. Um, we don't have data on all of this unfortunately um but they certainly became aware of Indian cotton textiles at an early date and prized them prized them and yeah you know um the thing about the changing fashion taste that amuses me most is that when the brits went over belatedly you know un unfortunately the risk of sounding you know, like a pejorative, but the, the Europeans are always late for everything when it comes. To <laughs> a day late and a dollar short, cowboy. <laughs> you know, it turned up late, you know, when part, the party was virtually over and claimed that, you know, not only had they invited everybody, but uh, <laughs> that everybody had to come back. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, so this had all been going on. So that when the, when the Europeans, especially the French and the British, arrived in Africa, you know, and they um the 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 french didn't really develop their own cotton textile industry but the british as we know did um but they were so frustrated because you know these so-called manchester cottons just weren't really selling very well um and that was the main thing that the african slavers wanted um but the the fashion the cotton textiles weren't just something that the african slavers wanted it was you know the, the the population in general it was they were very popular yeah and they were constantly changing and you know there's that passage in the book there's that quote that i give that where the the brits would sort of they didn't really they weren't able to track the changes right the way the indians did this 
is they had people in the interior, middlemen, African middlemen, Patamaras, Bashan Bauti, who actually went into the interior with these cotton textiles. They often tweaked them at some point. So rapid were these changes, right? And then they would basically paint the kind of style they wanted, give them back to the Indian brokers. They would then get them back to India. And then the, the weavers and the, the um, dye painters and so on would then quickly change and then produce for that. And then they'd go back. The Brits had no idea about any of this. Yeah. So they would wander in there, you know, with their Manchester cottons. And by the time they got to marketplace, the fashions had already changed. They literally had to take them home. They might as well have dumped them off in the channel. <laughs> you know, at, at, at quite a loss. Um, Unbelievable. So actually, why African fashion tastes were changing so much, that I don't know. What I do know is that they did, that it was a huge problem for the, for the British, that the Indians found a way of attacking with me. Um, and I think, you know, what the, the other thing that amused me is that, you know, when the French fashion tastes change, well, that's civilization. But when the African fashion tastes change, well, that's just damned annoying. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, you know, I lived and worked in Africa for 10 years and you you travel around Africa and they are, I mean, the, the colors and the patterns and the yeah. prints and the the batiks and the yeah and the, the saris and, the, and yeah. it's, it's just a kaleidoscope and and i'm sure you know it's it's still changing i'm sure they you know they they, they have the i guess the they have very sophisticated tastes you know and and uh well, that's right and and i think that's important to point out um not as some kind of cringy wokist apologist but that that's what was going on yeah, uh, we're told all oh, these were just primitive savages who just wore loincloths <laughs> or maybe fig leaves or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, this was this was in many ways. I call it the Afro-Indian pivot of the first global economy for a reason. Yeah. You know, this is this was the heart of it all. Not Europe. It was this was where all the action really lay. Yeah, yeah. The global economy kind of revolved around this Afro-Indian pivot and. You know, we need to know more about that. Not, um, but you know, all that disappears under the carpet of Eurocentrism yeah, and sadly yeah. of Eurofascism too. That's why I take on Walter Rodney there, who's always seen as the darling of post-colonialism. He's the one who said that, you know, well, the what did uh, what did the slavers um, buy or exchange slaves for when they traded slaves with the British? Pots and kettles full of holes. <laughs> Well, you know, do you really think that these African <laughs> slavers who had rounded up the slaves, marched them six, seven, eight hundred miles overland, paid off local um, chiefs, uh, chiefs, yeah, with, with their lives to get them across the land? Do you really think they came all that way for pots and kettles full of holes? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Now let's jump back over to India. Uh, did Britain actively work? Because there, what you did point out, there was a time when eventually the Indian Empire, uh, at least in terms of cotton, uh, did Britain actively work to destroy India's, um, you know, cotton? Uh, I forgot. I'm having a brain burp. What is ICT? Um, Indian context us. Yeah. After 1820, or was it only a question of market dynamics? I understood that the East um, Indian uh, companies had had a large army in India. So, was it just naked, uh, uh, naked market forces, naked brutal, you know, imperialism, or was it a mixture of both? Uh, it's a great question, and you've clearly read the book. <laughs> if you got, if you got as far as. Um, Chapter, I think that was chapter 12, wasn't it? Chapter 12? No, chapter 13. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with this. Um, and, you know, it, Shashi, Tarur, Shashi Tarur has done his, has done his book on, you know, um, on the, the, basically the economic rape of, of India by Britain. What the heck did he call it? Um, it's only, it came out a few years ago. Very, very useful little book. Oh, dear God. Sorry about this. I've, uh, 
When they buy the book, they can re they can look it up in the index. <laughs> That's annoying, isn't it? I've, I'm frustrated. Anyway, um, Inglorious Empire. Inglorious Empire. Okay. Inglorious Empire. Inglorious Empire. And you know, you can, you can, you you can right. um, get get a. He's done these various debates at the Oxford Union, which you can see on YouTube. Just Google it, and you'll find it. And he's, you know, he produces the classic kind of picture that post-colonialists and Afri and Indian nationalists will all embrace, which is that India was a going concern. India was doing well. These awful Brits came along. They colonized India. They screwed it over completely. Yeah. Raped and, and plundered it. They industrialized it. <laughs> Um, and they did it in all sorts of awful ways, cutting people's weavers' thumbs off and spinners' thumbs off and all this kind of thing. Right, so this, again, is another one of those balancing acts that I'm having to perform in here. Um, now, bear in mind, too, that although I didn't get into depth, when I did my Eastern Origins book, I sort of re I sort of bought into that classic de mm -hmm. Now I'm going back on it. Why? Again, it's like the West Asian slave trade. When you when you bring in this kind of argument, you're going to be accused of being a British apologist. Yeah. My argument is I'm not interested in apologizing for what Britain yeah. did in India. I have no truck with what they did in India. Um, none whatsoever. <clears throat> I'm not going to defend their, their presence in India. My argument is that they weren't quite as powerful as everyone makes them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the Indians weren't as pathetic, helpless, and useless as the Indian nationalists like to portray them as. And you are back into that victims and villains discourse, mm -hmm. back into that binary. Um, and, you know, the argument is that the Indians were nowhere near as as, as uh, helpless. Um, and, you know, when you crunch the numbers, do all the work, you know, despite the British, um, the Britain's best interests to hobble the cotton textile industry, they didn't succeed. Um, and the fact that, you know, so the Indian nationalists like Shashi, who I've got a lot of time for, uh, is a very nice guy. And, 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 I, and I, I support a lot of the spirit of what he says, but I just think that he's underestimating his own people. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what I'm struggling with. Um, and yeah, I don't want this to be a binary zero sum game where it, if you say, well, actually, they were more resilient, then somehow you're letting the Brits off the hook. No, they were doing their best to screw the whole thing over, right? So let's not. <laughs> but the Indians were able to resist. So when you look at those figures, you know, that were always trotted out about how um, sort of in the 19th century after 1820, 1830, you know, um, British imports into India just were like 58% of the market was British imports, you know, that they were basically wiping it out. Well, yeah, but what they forget to tell you, and you've got that diagram, you've got that figure in there, what they forget to tell you is that production's doubled in that period, so that actually Britain, so that in effect, Indian production levels pretty well retained their levels throughout the 19th century. There's a slip off, there's a drop off about 25% in 1870, 1880, and then it recovers. But the notion that the 19th century was just a wipeout by the Brits is not true. But those that gets ignored because people don't drill down into the figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and yes, Indian cotton spinners had a hard time, but they also ended up importing um, British cotton because it was cheaper, uh, even though it wasn't as good, right? It wasn't as good as, as the muslin that um, was produced in Bengal, but it was cheaper, so they bought it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and there's a whole load of arguments there that um, that, that just do away with this. Um, the again, you know, this notion that Britain deindustrialized India was not on an industrialization path. Now that yeah. took me years to get to, Jeff. Yeah. I was always into that kind of post colonial argument. Well, you know, they could have done it. You hear Shashi saying this. He'll, he'll talk about this. Well, India was probably on a path. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't. And, and <laughs> or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint. Um, yeah. But it wasn't that. And, and then again, he's trying to have it both ways there because he's sort of saying, well, you know, we Indians were, were capable enough to do something like this, but, but not capable enough to withstand the British. 
you know, he's kind of mixing and matching his agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but no, I think the Indians could have industrialized. I think the, in the Chinese could have industrialized. There was no need for it. There was no desire. Mm -hmm. The things that pushed the British to industrialize, those conditions did not exist mm -hmm. either in China or India. Um, but so I don't think that they had any desire or any intention to industrialize. Um, so they didn't actually have a modern capitalist industry in cotton textiles. It was a historical capitalist industry, um, which was very, very effective. Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. need to. Um, so you know, this notion of deindustrializing, again, that's that's a little bit of sleight of hand there. There was no industrialization, there's no industrialized Indian cotton textile sector in the first place to deindustrialize. Um, so I think. There's a major set of problems, there, none of which is to let the British off the moral hook, which is always what it comes back to with Indian nationalism and that and and Euro fetishism. Um, you know, firing 400 Indians out of cannon um, for the Indian mutiny is is just one small example one could give about the things that the Brits did. Um, but I think they've exaggerated the power and force of. Mm -hmm. the All right. One last heavy duty question. A lot of philosophy here, contemplating um, uh, war. Uh, you talk a lot about the the correlation between war, capitalist industrialization of iron and steel, and even cotton because of all the uniforms and tents and everything else. With the lack of wars in China after 1368, this while you tie together Britain's wars and, and the capitalist class, militarism, industrialization, and ca you know the, the 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 amassing of capital for investment. Just uh, to to close out this wonderful discussion, just talk about that um, um, uh, the the nexus between all these forces of war, industrialization, um, uh, and capital. Yeah, yeah, it's um, a big story, and uh, and we, uh, you've given me more time than you probably should have. So let me try and and, and get a, a grip on this. Um, I mean, if you go back to China during the Song period, um, you know this is where where an industrialization in terms of iron and steel was entirely plausible. Um, now, yeah, they they. I mean, they they did have. Don't forget, they did have mechanized production. Right? So so they they had water driven. Um, uh, what do you call the, uh, the the air pumps into the furnaces? <laughs> oh, baffles. Well, Aren't they I'm trying to. I'm, my brain has just gone. But but the point is that they they had mechanized those flues. Flues weren't they? I don't know. Yeah, flues or baffles. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, water powered um oh, sorry the, the, the names is gone but you know what the pumps the air in to um keep the furnace um hot for steel yeah yeah um so so they had all that going um and they were producing very large amounts of it as i said earlier um and of course the song period is is a particularly important period militarily um in china's history for the fans out there, that's roughly 900 to 1,200. Roughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, you've got, you, you know, you've got the uh, Jin Dynasty and you've got the conflict between the Northern and the Southern Song. And, you know, this is not an easy time. And, but they, they led to sort of major conflicts. Um, and so I think that it's not a coincidence that there was so much iron production going on. You know, don't forget that the iron production began back in the time of the Warring States period in China, <laughs> you know, yeah. 1500 years earlier. That's what, <laughs> that's principally what triggered it. Um, so uh, that was all going on. Now, after 1368, the end of the um, uh, Mongol Yuan dynasty um, and the rise of the Ming, um, these sorts of conflicts went away. Uh, they, they, they weren't these kind of major conflicts that China faced. Um, uh, at any point in time, um, yes, they had conflicts with the Mongols, but they weren't major sort of, you know, the Mongol, Mongol warfare was basically, you know, uh, cavalry based warfare, um, but not not the kind of 
what you had in in Europe with the long pike. Um, mm-hmm. but, you know, they would they would they would. It was kind of mobile um, process where they would just use their swords and cut people down. Um, it, you didn't have all the shock cavalry that you had in Europe. Um, so it was it was pretty primitive. Uh, quite an effective mode of warfare, actually, but it was primitive. It didn't require any kind of major industrialization whatsoever to meet it. And I think in the end, that was the principal difference. Um, but in in Europe, you know, you had whole nations going to, to war with each other, mm-hmm. always constantly having to ramp up the, the uh, mode of warfare and the, and the means by which they prosecuted it. Um, and so gradually, you know, guns came in, cannon came in, um, and and uh, and iron was particularly important for all this, for bullets and all the rest of it. Um, no, the Chinese don't forget were the ones who invented the gun. <laughs> yeah, three hundred years before it was adopted by the West. Well, seventy-five, <laughs> the first metal barrel gun firing a metal bullet. Well, seventy-five, for God's sake. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I mean, always the date given for the maybe first. Maybe it wasn't three. Maybe it was a hundred years or well in advance. <laughs> well, the cannon, the cannon, the first cannon in Britain was pictured in thirteen twenty-six. But that was the same as the eruptor, which yeah, was yeah. entered in 1290. But actually, you know, more recent, you know, because that comes from the Needham stuff. The more recent work suggests that that the Chinese had got these sorts of cannon in place by the early 12th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the 1100. Right. Yeah. Um, now, these were the guys who started it all. But what happened was um, there was no real need to keep it going. Um, after 1368, the the Europeans, however, were constantly trying to <laughs> kill each other. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. You know, the Chinese had found a way of avoiding all that nonsense. Not the Europeans, so they were they were busy trying to chop each other up, and with ever more sophisticated technologies, they then took the lead in terms of developing these. Yeah. Um, and that's of course eventually culminated, you know, with the Arrow War and. Um, in, in 1839 and 40, which was the big shock to China. Um, yeah. and, and China had actually been adapting some of the European technologies, which were adaptations of the Chinese technology. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, bottom line is, in order to be able to pay for all this, yes, you get the national debt, you get in 1694, the Bank of England is created, the City of London actually is based on military contracts. They would effectively lend the money to the state, so, so what what um, Sven Beckett talks about when he talks about war capitalism? It's exactly what was going on in Britain. It, it kind of led the way in this respect, and it yeah. also was crucial. It's a crucial hothouse, as Marx would say, for the development of capitalism. And then, yeah. of course, the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> here we are today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, John, this has been wonderful. What are your current plans for writing and research? You mentioned a book about uh, the origins of Islam. I lived and worked in Africa and the Middle East uh, for ten years, and and so I, I have a real uh, have a real um, appreciation for uh, the the Arab world and the Islamic world. What else? What are you going to be doing uh, after after we after we hit the uh, hang up button? Yeah. Um... Uh, uh, well, various admin tasks. If, if I'm being honest, <laughs> but, but um, in ter- no, but in ter- I'm I'm so, I'm on the I would say I'm on the final furlong of this book, um, and it, it's called Recovering the Origins of Islam, and it's subtitled uh, A Critique of the Radical Revisionist School of Islamic Studies. Um, and bottom line is that you know you've got all these um, radical revisionists, Western Western theorists who've come along and basically said that. Islam is a complete hoax. Oh. It was an invention made up either in the late seventh century, 60, 70 years after Muhammad's death, or sometime in the Abbasid periods, late eighth, early ninth. The late eighth, early ninth has been more or less um, uh, put to bed, but the late seventh century still rules. So they say things like Mecca was, Mecca never really existed, Muhammad was not born there. Um, it was later chosen as the holy sanctuary for political purposes um, that uh, Islam was really born either in northwest Arabia or in southern Syria. Um, 
It's you know, all sorts of stuff going on here that you know will make your average Muslim's blood. Yeah, boil. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, so right. basically, what I'm doing, it's absolutely fascinating. It's another one of these detective stories that I've gone on, uh, where I'm basically just trying to sort of reply to all those things and and recover the original story. I mean, I'm not a Muslim, um, but I've got a lot of respect for Islam, and I think Islam is very badly misunderstood in the West. Yeah, yeah. If you meet Muslims. And you get to know them, you know, they they are they are wonderful people and they will do things for you that even though I'm a Christian, Christians won't do for you. Yeah, I uh, well, I lived and worked. Uh, I lived and worked in the in the Muslim Arab world for 10 years. And so and, I, and in fact, uh, it, uh, Arabic is my best foreign language. Uh, I, wow. I, mean, I, mas I mastered wow. it. I mastered it uh, reading, writing and and. Um, speaking in fact that was one of the reasons i was kind of burned out on on arab uh arabic uh, and 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 wanted a change and so that's why my wife and i ended up going to china and that, that started yeah. my a whole new adventure so yeah i love i love that some nomadic existence you've lived jeff and we and we really and we really miss it we talk about it a lot how fun you know our fondness for uh the people in that part of the world and Africa too. I mean, just the whole, that whole area is just, uh, the, the people are just wonderful. Yeah. Well, listen, in Taoist, Buddhist, Confucius fashion, I will give you a Thanks, nice, Jeff. I will give you a nice bow. Thank yeah. you so much, John. And, oh, no, uh, thanks, Jeff. and I will get this up and hopefully you can share it with, uh, with people. Maybe you can even show it as a, as a lecture. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> I've got various people I'll send it around. So that, that's great, Jeff. Thanks so much for reading the book and taking it taking Well, the we will we, we will stay in touch. We become we we become good uh, uh across the channel friends uh over the last uh, couple of years. So uh great fun, Jeff. All right, talk to you later. Bye bye. Thanks, Jeff.